UK. Hi, Heidi. Hey, Irina. Nice Why to be here. Nice to see you. <laughs> How are you today? Great. And you? Oh, I can see a lot of uh, nice people joining us today. Lovely. Yeah, we have all the destination marketing experts here today. So it will be a very good discussion, I'm sure. Looking forward. <laughs> Yeah, excellent. So, um, yeah, just before we start with the questions, Heidi, I know that you were very busy the past months. You had a digital trip that you brought event planners digitally uh, to Stavanger in Norway to showcase the destination. Um, you used new platforms. Hello, Sabrina. Uh, you used a new platform. It wasn't a Zoom. It wasn't a team meeting. Um, you used, uh, social, uh, you, you used social media, you did a social media campaign, and you, you had a very, very diverse mi communication mix. So, um, and then the concluding uh, remarks, I remember what you said at the closing part is that it's, uh, we've seen what the future of destination marketing is about. So um, let's, uh, maybe you give us a little bit brief overview of what the digital trip was, and then we go straight to the questions. First of all, thank you everybody for joining and waving back at everyone. <laughs> uh, well, uh, the digital trip for the people who, who uh, have not been uh, seeing anything on social media lately, uh, it was a two-day live immersive event uh, showcasing uh, the destination of Stavanger, where we invited event professionals to come and enjoy the destination from their own perspective in real time. There were lots of activities, um, uh, show cooking, uh, mentalist parties, um, we try to include lots of different elements of the destination like gastronomy, culture, history, lifestyle, music, arts, all of these things to be explored. So, uh, so uh, basically the event professionals could learn about the destination but could also learn about different ways of marketing themselves. Like the digital trip was really um, showing how you can do something better than a Zoom, car, uh, a Zoom call or a um, uh, a, a typical webinar with a PowerPoint presentation or, you know, your uh, breakfast coffee invite uh, that several destinations has been, have been doing. This was kind of next level and showing the possibilities of how to do something much more engaging and immersive. And that's what we need to be doing right now, especially now that everybody is so bored with virtual events already. Yeah. Yeah. They want to see something new. Yeah, I think also you talked about going from just broadcasting to engagement, which engagement is really the difference between having just um, an online event, which is pretty much everything. Online event can be a Zoom meeting, but virtual event is different because it has its own dedicated platform and it has a very strong element of engagement. And I think you also emphasized it during the trip very well. You included different engagement elements and quizzes and gamification and walking so it was very um very engaging so thanks now um let's move to our questions and uh first one what new skill set is required for destination marketing post covid well, uh, you mentioned already one now in the introduction, it's kind of important to have the understanding of the difference between general online events and a virtual event. That's one of the things that we also uh, dived into during our educational track at the digital trip. We kind of explained, we started by explaining the basics and a lot of CVBs and destinations and event professionals were uh, very happy about that to, to get a sense of terminology and understand new kinds of requests that are coming in uh, based on that. So with a virtual event, you really need to have that balance between pre-recorded and live, as well as also the the number two key component is, as you mentioned, engagement. You need to build engagement and interactivity on so many different levels. And that is from before your event with your social campaigns, email campaigns, whatever you're doing, that can be competitions, any type of, of engagement that you create. And of course, during the event with all those elements like chats and polls and questions and video chatting and, and special hangouts and uh, gamification with an app and things like that. And also afterwards. So so the, the terminology of a what is a virtual event is where to start really 
And then you mentioned the, the event platform. We took it away from Zoom and from your regular tools that most companies have been using, used actual event technology that we had been uh, testing and demoing for, for months and months before the event. We actually compared so many different event platforms and tech that we could use to build our tech stack. And that was also very important because do, taking that education about what actually is needed in creating and designing virtual events and the whole process, process connected to it, you realize that it is really one of the most important things to build an event out of the objectives and not the other way around. Don't use a Zoom because you have a Zoom membership and then you have to push your event in there. No, you have to, you know, think about the event. What is it that you're trying to achieve? Who is your audience? What do you want to do? What is your vision? What do you want to create? And then find the right tools and the event technology mm -hmm. that is needed to accomplish that. Yeah, and I know that before doing the digital trip and choosing your platform, you also did an extensive research. You tested multiple platforms. So it, also, it, was, it required quite also time investment to go and research the platforms. So, okay. Um, so um, any other skills required, like social media, uh, or, a lot. <laughs> or you, you outsource and the uh, question from Peter from the mice board is it not too much work so I think he's um, referring to doing the platform research mm -hmm. well actually it is a lot of work and that's my the first thing I say to people asking uh, how to get started you have to be sure that you really want to do this <laughs> because <laughs> because it is very intense you have to do like go and get yourself educated or upskilled you need to spend a lot of time and this is not just for one event because if you work out of an objective you might not be using the same event technology for your next event you know you might have different objectives and you might use different tools and then you need to learn those tools so it's a continuous process and also the event tech providers are uh, like in such a rapid evolution like they are designing new things all the time and there's platforms that come out of nowhere and there is event technology that gets outdated very quickly so you also constantly need to update yourself so first before you get started with anything decide do I want to venture into virtual events or is this not for me and will I perhaps be using an exter external partner to help me with virtual events true and I have very good um, comment from Sabrina adding that your platform is your venue so it's essential to ensure you pick the right one for your objective and goals of the event and this is so true because uh, not every venue fits your event and that's the same as virtual platform and sometimes it can be even zoom or instagram live but when you want to do something bigger and uh, then it has to be a um, dedicated platform actually we will come later to this question so yeah so just uh, wrapping up the skill part skills part so how about like social media community building, for example, community manager, I think it's also one of the skills required for the digital environment. So any um, additions? Yeah, really putting yourself out there more than before because now all of the communication is happening on social media channels and this is where you show your brand you you build trust you build your community your community that will eventually attend your event so so you need to be able to take that step and to reach out to your followers and be there um, be more engaging than you were before it's not enough anymore for a destination or an event professional to just uh, post a few things about the services they offer they have to be there they have to be visible as a person as a destination and as a support entity as well for the entire community and Sabrina is raising her hand of course Sabrina is one of the key people to 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 talk to if you want to build your brand online and be visible and use social media for everything it's worth uh, I mean hot hospitality exchange is uh, is an amazing partner we've also partnered with Sabrina on the digital trip to do all of our uh, social media campaigning so 
that is one of the tools that you need. And it's about not only social media, but content creation. Like those things take a lot of time. You know, you also work with that, Irina. You're also a part of this. You know, you're connected to us. And content creations and social media marketing are now absolute musts and we are getting there with the virtual strategy as well yeah. compared to a few years ago where you still had companies saying like yeah okay we're not on instagram we're not there we're not here to have fun we're actually a serious business now you cannot be a serious business without be having an active instagram account it, there's just no way and at the same time we are now a kind of communicating this new message about why it's important to have a virtual strategy. Virtual events are not going away. Virtual events will be here forever. Also when in-person uh, events come back, there will be a balance. And it's important that you develop a strategy as a company, as an event planner on how to move forward and that you have those skills either internally or by partnering with different people in your network. Yeah, um, we have a comment from Peter saying that uh, people are tired about doing all these registration processes for so many different online events. Or, And I agree, I do share this opinion that people are tired of registering. And we will come to this um, question actually a bit later where we will talk about open platforms like social media where you don't need to register, like live streaming versus the closed platforms where you need to register. So it's a very, very valid question. And Sabrina adding so true, social media and content strategy is essential now for any business, brand and event now. Yes, 100% totally. agree. Um, comment from Peter, again, you understand this, but the most of CVB's convention bureaus are waiting that the good old times come back. And I think yeah. we realize now that it's not, not going to happen. It's not, it's not going to happen. Uh, we've removed um, and we moved on. Uh, the event sizes, I see, like the size of the event will reduce. Uh, I think in the future, the comeback um, will be a bit slow. Um, yesterday, I read on Reuters that it's expected to bounce back to the same level of 2019, only in 2025. 20, yeah. So um, we still um, have some time until 2025, uh, and we need to explore the virtual space. Let me, let me add something uh, quickly. I mean, it's really interesting to see now how you have a new gap uh, forming between the destinations who are forward thinkers and who are actually hopping on these new um, marketing techniques and for example the ones att who attended our edu educational track with the digital trip they are very eager to start the process and to keep uh, being visible and promoting themselves with immersive virtual experiences and then you have those destinations that Peter, Peter mentions often with, with you know the dinosaurs in the industry kind of having done this, the thing in the same way for 15 20 years uh, they are scared to to some of the people working for them are scared to become irrelevant or don't understand what's happening or you know there is this this gap forming now between the very modern forward thinking innovative destinations and the ones that are more traditional and a little bit reluctant or scared to to get into that way of promoting themselves and the ones that are innovating are obviously going to be the ones who attract business first as soon as they can yeah um, we have from Peter a question what is your experience did convention bureaus understand that virtual events will kill indirect revenues taxes if planners don't come real in the destination and um, I actually I hear this comment also before from another colleague in the destination marketing space because um, the role of the destination actually is to bring business to the destination. So what will be the role of the convention bureau if you get the audience online, but they don't get, you don't get them to the destination? So, well, I mean, the, the main thing here is that your online audience are your in-destination audience and you are able to reach out to so many more people with a virtual event and virtual promotion than you would uh, 
otherwise with let's say a regular familiarization trip let's say you do you do a familiarization trip for 12 15 maybe maximum 20 people you invite key event planners into your destination and show them what you got now you're doing the same thing but you are showing it to so many more people so many relevant people at the same time and you can invite them back over and over and over again to look into the details that are of the most interest to them in designing their events those are still the same people coming to your destination they are not just going to do the virtual event and then forget about you they are getting excited by your virtual event like with the digital trip i have had so many emails now in the last couple of days of people wanting to know what's the flight connections when what's the situation with covid they are super interested because they had a taste of all the things you can do in the destination and now they really want to go there that's the whole point of it it's not to stop getting people to travel to the destination it's the absolute opposite it gets more people into the destination as soon as they are allowed to travel again yes i think so too and uh, it's like this visibility and this presence and being ready and actually like your legacy of knowing how to handle this whole covid situation and and then also like some of the people yes they are business people but they are also leisure people so they can also come on a leisure there with their family so you're kind of you're targeting on many levels here and um, yes the destinations as peter mentioned they need the taxes to generate the taxes of course and the aim of the online event is to bring them the audience to the destination because one day we will be able to travel and especially the destination marketing it, sometimes it takes like years to win a congress like 3 5 years it's a long term investment so you should be investing now for having this business in 5 years so it's um, yes don't stop yeah so let's see what we have from sabrina i don't understand how as a brand if you are in a situation where you can't market traditionally why wouldn't you be looking into different more current way ways or at least experiment this is absolutely true people today when you just go out and you observe people in the train or in the supermarket they are stuck on their phones they are on instagram so why wouldn't you want to market your destination on instagram we have a golden opportunity comment from frankfurt uh, meetings convention bureaus have to adapt to planners uh, needs mm-hmm. um, as these needs are currently changing convention bureaus have to change too that's very true Absolutely you know actually that is one of the key reasons in uh, when i look at uh, the feedback of uh, destination cvbs that have been in touch with us and have done the educational track etc one of the key reasons is a basic understanding of the terminology and everything that is related to virtual events because for a cvb it's super important to know what a a client actually is asking you know one of the the biggest mistakes you can make is uh, offering something that you don't have enough knowledge about so they need to know not necessarily to to understand all of the details themselves but they need to know what the requests will look like they need to know who to connect those clients with and who can actually deliver on those requirements super important fact yeah and frankfurt uh, is definitely uh, one of those destinations that is looking into things um, Um, we are also already working with with different destinations around the world on uh, on doing more of that education and working together on 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 virtual promotion i hope you'll join us as well at uh, frankfurt meetings peter is adding um but the my sales is contact fixes they prefer a face to face zoom call before doing a streaming to reach bigger audience um again um i think it will change and this is another question we will cover later and we'll talk about new event formats because having this face to face meetings on zoom is just like duplicating this hosted by a model in the virtual space which doesn't work and i will share an example of how to make effective networking in a later question so let's move on heidi <laughs> um we see promotion and this was also an interesting um question also asked by peter previously we see promotion on social media and through closed platforms so the class closed platforms i mean like um invent or um, 
uh, spot me for example event platforms mm -hmm. yeah and um, what are the pros and cons of each method like making it public without registration link or uh, having a closed platform where people need to register and which one do you prefer um very difficult question actually both have a lot of positives and um and and not so many negatives to be honest um it's important if you go uh, if you do social media live events like we're doing an ig live now and you did the digital festival for example a while back and it was all social media based that was that allowed you to attract a wide audience and a wide network on social media so that is a great bonus it also allows people to hop in whenever they want to uh, they see something is going live they might join or they might not join they might rewatch it later there's a, a bunch of, of positives with that and you might reach a wider audience uh, than you expected um, especially also people watching it again over and over uh, afterwards with a, a closed event platform you have an ability to really lock in your audience you need to get them there first so you need to be also engaging on social media and bringing that message out why they should come to your closed platform and why it will be worth it for them uh, what is the value that you will be offering there but once they are there you have a, a more a direct connection with the audience they are not as um, spread out or volatile uh, hopping in as much uh, in and out as much you will have them there as long as your content is worth it you will have the people to connect with and to talk to directly so it's 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 much more uh, intimate it's kind of like a private event in re in person as well like a public event where everybody the general uh, audience or 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 inhabitants or public can join in and walk in and out or you have a closed event a corporate event where it's it's invitees only and it's uh, guests only and they are also more tight knit than a wider audience would be so yeah. so that's for me the biggest advantage of an event platform and of course the fact that you can do so much more in terms of production live streaming uh, you know uh, engagement interactivity networking tools etc you can build so many components into uh, an event platform yeah there is also a commitment element to this and it's something that I, uh, this commitment and the med psychology is something that like I got interested through a lot of conversations with uh, Victoria Matei, Victoria. the mm -hmm. med psychology specialist. And this is like the commitment that you make. You, you give your email, you sign up, you are committed to attend an event and it takes place on, on a certain platform. So there are also psychological elements to this, I think. And um, there are pros and cons to, to both, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, the digital festival i decided actually to create it like to the audience uh, for the audience and like have and i wanted actually to have this big reach so this was my objective but i know that if i wanted to um to have like a more intimate group uh more exclusive then i would definitely have maybe chosen even the zoom it was like in june so it's like we still talk about zoom back then <laughs> but now there are many more um platforms available so yeah, definitely there are so many pros and cons. And again, I think also the quality of the stream, I think, because we did a digital festival, you did a live stream, uh, Instagram live stream with your phone. And for the digital trip, you had a production crew of five people there. So like the level of production you can't compare. So it's like how, how professionally you want to go, how professionally you want to showcase your product because it's a destination. If you bring a Congress for 400 people, it's a lot, it, it's a big um, investment, financial investment from the people who book it. So they also want like to see that you are capable as a destination to showcase the destination in the best light. So yeah, you're not going to do a Congress on your phone. Yeah, exactly. So you're not going to do a showcase, um, virtual showcase probably on your phone. <laughs> so yeah, mm. so there are like pros and cons and maybe also like finding a balance is important. So like on a daily, on a daily, basis instagram post linkedin post also a couple of side inspections maybe with your phone but then if you want to do it really really good then you need to consider a high production value 
Um, let's, we have a question um, from Sabrina. The question is, what will it actually take for destinations to actually change their ways? What do you think is stopping them? <laughs> it's, a, it's a daily fight, really. <laughs> Like yesterday, I reached a whole new low in in trying to fight for for understanding um, at CVBs. It's it's really about that. First, as we mentioned, understand what virtual events is and virtual promotion is, and that it will remain a requirement and that it's not going anywhere. Uh, that's one thing building that knowledge together with them about, you know, everything from terminology to actually uh, the future of marketing, because this is what really we're talking about here, not only destination marketing, but, but marketing in a general sense that will combine social media and virtual strategies. Uh, so first that, the educational part. And then it's always a matter of budget. People are always scared uh, to uh, assign budget to things that they don't fully grasp yet and that is the same for social media campaigns for content creators for uh, virtual events etc all of those things as long as they're not solidified into the minds of those decision makers at the cvbs they will not be investing in it properly and they will be it's not that there is no budget as most people say there is always a budget but the budgets go to the wrong places the budgets go to old school marketing that is totally irrelevant at this point you know they are losing money in other areas where they could be using that budget to have new marketing uh, streams and new channels of, of uh, uh, revenue and interest for their destination by hopping on board and innovating and they are most of the CVBs unfortunately are very very slow at doing that and are very reluctant to change but if you want to be a leader if you want to be on top and as mentioned one of the first to be considered you have to be doing that right now and it's up to us to keep convincing people and I do that every single day I'm exhausted at the end of every single day trying to tell people like open your eyes look at the value look at the amount of people you are reaching out to look at what they are experiencing and why they are amazed by your destination because you are doing something new and it's also a whole bunch of data collection you have so much data at your disposal from virtual events now with the digital trip for example i can tell you exactly what everybody was interested in uh, about the destination stavanger that we showcased uh, this time around i can tell you who wanted how many people are interested in viking history or who wants the fjords or who wants gastronomy or you know who spent their time where and connecting with who we have all of that data available now and that in itself is gold for a destination because it shows them what they should be pushing out more, more uh, content about specific topics and just more things that are of interest to their core audience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Peter um, is saying, Convention Bureau's knows since years the same way. Sales calls, sales forum exhibitions, workshops, spam trips, and start the circle again. This is excellent point, Peter. And again, we have a question related to this because we think that this will change as well, that destinations will start charging planners for trips for vip boxes for event participation because the the era of this free stuff is about to end as Heidi said we we collected a lot of data we know who are our clients um, and we want to create customized products for these clients and we don't want to guess by getting 10 people on a fam trip and maybe one of them will book in a couple of years. Um, yeah, uh, Robert Dansmore is saying, marketing budgets are for tomorrow, not yesterday. Uh, Sabrina is saying, um, the ROI should be awareness, reach and engagement right now, not appointments and leads, cause that's not realistic right now. Yeah, everyone, I just, I love all these comments because they're so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, the people who are in this conversation, they have already a great understanding for what's happening, right? Yeah. Uh, so so it, it makes a difference. But 
what we forget is that we are trying to reach out to all of those CVBs who are not online, who are not with us in these IG lives, who are not connected at all, or even if, if, you, if you can take it to that extent. And also the end clients who need to be uh, interested in thinking virtually in terms of getting new knowledge about a destination, you know. So we have to keep pushing that message out over and over again. And as Robert said, it's for tomorrow, yes, obviously. Yeah. Marketing is always uh, for for uh, for uh, achieving results in the future, not today uh, as much as we would love to, but we have to invest now to have those, uh, those uh, people reaching out to us uh, yeah. again in the future yeah and we, really we need to think about the sale cycle in mice it's like two three years and you start with your instagram or social media strategy today so you have these customers in three years it's not very instant it's not it's not very transactional as you would go to a trade show and you have this appointment now we really it's it's changing and yes you maybe have and you know, like I was at um, hosted by events as an exhibitor, and I kind of I see the the hard work that goes there. So you meet this potential buyer, and you have the email, but it's not done. I mean, you have to go home, you have to work on this, you have to write them, you have to to maintain this relationship here. And this is just one on one. Here you have social media, you have your 300, 500 followers, and you you're able to broadcast the message about your destination and the, the, the relevant ones, it actually they will be attracted to you. So like the conversion rate is already higher. Um, yeah. So, and then you kind of can slide into the DMs and to the, <laughs> and, to the <laughs> email and then have a, a face-to-face or Zoom call. Um, you know, Irina, I mean, uh, I mentioned already the emails that came after the digital trip. It actually shows that people are much more eager to immediately plan something, even though they still cannot travel. They're already yeah. there because they are convinced that what you show, what you have shown is, is amazing. It's innovative. It's new. It's fresh. They want to be a part of it. So, so yeah, the conversion is, is uh, definitely uh, becoming uh, faster. Yeah, yeah. Peter is commanding U.S. sales events is truly illegal data trading, and I think if you have your social media, your own social media strategy, you own the data. It's not the exhibitor mm -hmm. owns the data. You own the data, and you know where what flows, what interests people, what triggers interest. So, again, it's it's a process. It's a process you have to start now. That in 2015, where travel hopefully bounces back to its normal 2019 level, you have it. Um, yeah, this uh, social media is very targeted, Sabrina adds. Okay, let's move to our next question. Um, what destination content is appropriate to share right now? Is it new openings? Is it song leadership? Is it updates on the COVID uh, situation at a destination? What is it good? What is good to share and what not? Uh Everything is okay. Uh, everything is allowed to share and everything is good as long as you have a really good balance. Like don't hard sell right now. Mm -hmm. People are tired of, uh, of, of destinations hard selling. Like uh, this is the, uh, the trip you should be taking. This is the venue you should be using. This is the hotel you should be booking. No, they are not there uh, in their, you know, mindsets. They want general information. They want to see something fresh, what is new about your destination, the new ways you are showing yourself generally with all of the highlights of your destination. But in the same time, they want to feel understood. They want to sh know that the destination understands their new uh, requirements, their new fears in terms of security, health and safety, etc. They want to be heard in terms of um, having solid partners that can help them out and show them exactly what the situation is on site. That's also one of the reasons why we chose the digital trip to be in real time and show a, real a realistic view of the destination. Like we had a bunch 
bunch of questions coming in like why is nobody wearing face masks what is happening here you know and it started a conversation so so it's about uh communicating all of those aspects not all, only what you've always been communicating and why your destination is amazing uh, but those new aspects of how you are dealing with the current situation um what is the situation for your destination is there travel allowed are people allowed to move freely how has it been handled who are the key partners right now um and then also um support i mentioned it many times community building and support and um reaching out through your social media with helpful uh knowledge that you can share that can benefit all of your followers not just look at me look at me this is me this is my destination this is my product but how can i help you how can we build something together that is of value for everybody yeah yeah we have a comment from johnny martinez um share content that inspires people and renews faith within our industry and again here yeah, i want to go back to event psychology and um people are not interested in how many rooms you have right now and um, no. and people are when they make a purchase decision usually they don't make a logical purchase decision because how many rooms you have or because how easy it's access the destination but as you said hard because it's you understand them you you talk to um to their you understand their needs and their wishes and you are being empathetic and uh it's it's very very important because right now people can't take rational decisions and when they do take a decision they justify their irrational decision by the rational aspects so mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's inspiration i think right now a uh, story uh story maker events says showing how the destination is innovating through the pandemic is a key right now um yeah absolutely there are um, certain destinations that are innovating that are supporting event planners to help them to help them plan events in the future um and i think also some destinations they stand out in a way that they just don't talk about themselves but they talk about the global industry and they they also collaborate with other convention bureaus um and there are some alliances and uh, collaborations that are forming so it's, uh, yeah. it's yeah That's really what we're talking about here the difference between those who dare take that step and are innovating and the ones who don't. Yeah. Okay, mm. so um let's move to our next question. We talk about starting paying for events. Uh do you think that that's the future? Will that help raise quality standards of business events and the content? Definitely. I mean, um it's important that the entire industry gets paid for what they are offering you know everything has a cost that was the case before as well if you get invited to to a, a familiarization trip somebody is paying for that it's not free stuff you know it doesn't appear out of nowhere and, and it's free a hotel is paying for you an airline is paying for you a dmc is paying for you every meal that you eat every drink that you have is paid for they don't come for free you know so it's the same with the with the virtual events there's a huge cost attached to producing a proper virtual event and even though we've been doing a lot for free in the last months and also offering a lot of very reduced rates um we will get to that point where we actually need to have people pay the actual value of a ticket right the only difference with virtual events is is that you are more relying also on sponsorships so it will decide on on your your partners um because the data that you have and that you can offer sponsors is very valuable so you will need to attract people to invest in the event but there will still be a more realistic price on the ticketing uh, than what we've seen so far some organizations and event planners have already taken that step um and you can see that there's still a lot of negativity coming from the audience or event planners in general uh as a reaction to that like why do i have to pay well if you are looking to find something of value that is of value to you be willing to pay for that those are people's jobs those are people's you know they are costs that need to be covered and if nobody is willing to pay for anything nothing can be delivered you know you can only get a support from from an an organization or the authorities wants to get 
through the pandemic or whatever or help you out but the actual cost of things is different so you cannot keep keep offering things for free and it's very important that we realize that as an entire industry because it's it's the whole chain it's the whole industry that is connected if we like for example with the digital trip we we use event technology but we use our local production teams we we have uh, camera people live streams av light sound whatever you have the full package venues etc that are used all of these people are getting paid all of these people are coming out of furlough or are able to do a job because of this project but we are paying for it and for now we've just like not had focus on getting money in from ticket sales or it was like a, a symbolic amount uh, compared to the actual ticket value but in terms of how we develop to, into the future we will see that there is first of all a bigger understanding for the value why you want to participate in an event and 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 also be realistic that virtual events will need to have a great value proposition and will need to elevate their standard to be able to continue impressing event planners and convincing them to attend in the first place mm -hmm. right but once they are sure that there is value for them there uh, they will be willing to pay and that's the same if you are an exhibitor at a trade show i mean you pay a significant amount to be there and to have the opportunity to meet maximum 30 people over the course of several days you have your all of your costs related to that you can have the same results and the same value during a virtual event only thinking about the networking component and uh, you know there's so much more to it so we will need to move to that stage where we are willing to make the same investment to actually attend virtual events and have those results as we were used to before in attending in-person events yeah. and you mentioned it as well there was already a trend for organizers destinations dmcs etc to start charging for in-person familiarization trips because because there's such it's not about the volume you don't need a hundred people coming if you will get business from one within five years it's such a poor ROI right so now the same thing is happening with virtual you will need that commitment that person who has a significant like a real interest in doing business with you and who actually has the potential business for you already in hand. They will be eager and committed and they will be willing to pay a fee for getting all of the information they need. That's already the case with, with a lot of big uh, communication agencies, marketing bureaus. They do that because they understand the value and they want some somebody who is designated to them and will offer them a much higher level of quality than th what they can get for free. You know, that's just the reality of things. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I shared this uh, two days ago, um, a post on Instagram about the sales funnel and uh, appealing to the top, middle and the bottom of the funnel. And the top of the funnel is where you have like the thought leadership. So you as a convention bureau or a DMC share content on social media, which is thought leadership about COVID, about a destination, uh, inspiration, venues, etc. And then as you go down the funnel, on the bottom of the funnel, it comes to engagement. And then this engagement has to be paid for because you are actually talking, you have your individual case study, you have your individual needs, your requirements, you can exchange in this group, in this virtual event environment, you can exchange with other members. And this is a very, very valuable connection. Um, so um, yeah, there is definitely space for paying. Um, also now uh, we, d we don't know like who is still has business, who is out of business. So um, if you have business, then you, you are likely to be interested and to attend this event and actually educate yourself as well about, about like um, the destination also like very good destinations they have very strong COVID um, protection practices health and safety in place so they actually can educate the planners how to organize their events safely so i think this is a huge value that you don't really find online but it's a very specific to the destination um so, the quality um, is so much higher uh, higher like i i remember the a, a series we did 
together about the, the DMC value proposition, uh, it's the same thing. Like you can decide not to work with the DMC and go and do research yourself online on Google and, and spend uh, so many more hours and uh, have such a much higher cost in the end and then have a much lower quality result because you are not on site, you don't have the information. It's the same now. People who are willing to pay are looking for the right quality information immediately serve to them yeah 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 and i think there should, should be like when we talk about payments there should be some good balance about paying for like like for the purpose uh, of what you want but also like not overpaying because i see some events industry events they charge 300 400 dollars i think this is way too expensive uh, in personal opinion, but when you see other events, they charge maybe a hundred or, for example, the web summits, they even offered like a ticket for female founders for like 37 euros, which was still, which was a symbolic price, but you, you are ready to pay something, but you also don't want to break your bank when paying for, uh, for the event. So I think there should be also a right balance. I, I don't understand that like our costs are, always much more higher <laughs> that's always like this and uh, but yeah there should be some some balance i think in this mm -hmm. yeah in this um, time it's important to to keep supporting uh, everybody yeah um so sabrina says there is this long-standing entitlement culture that needs to change and become a more give and take relationship yes um the industry has been invited to many trade shows and hosted by our um basis so there is certain like entitlement and that you are invited everywhere as well and you are high on demand um to attend these events but i think now as people are also becoming a bit more selective with their time especially when it comes to virtual events and um, i would rather prefer paying to a virtual event than like going everywhere just because uh, i i'm invited or um have to to attend and it's entitlement that is uh, it's it's fake entitlement right i mean i would really like to lo i'd love to see all of the numbers of all those hosted buyer programs like what business actually has come out of it or has materialized based on an invitation it's it's very low I can I can imagine that it's very low. So so it's important that people understand that. I totally agree with with Sabrina that once you get used to something and you always get stuff for free, then uh, then you yeah it becomes normal to you. But well, but you forget that this is a huge cost for someone. Mm -hmm. So in in fair business, you are supposed to respect that. And you are supposed to do your best to, to give give back to those people who have invited you. Yeah, yeah. And I think there should be also like the balance between having a sponsorship and also having to pay for this because when you look at other industries and other events, especially in the tech industries, they have huge sponsors. Like, you know, you, you see like Microsoft and Google and McKinsey, like all these sponsors and you still need to pay a fair price for the ticket. So like for other industries, nothing is for free. And for the events uh, industry, it's still this like entitlement culture, like uh, that you have to get something for free no i think we really need like to start a new era mm -hmm. here um we have a comment from um elaine clients will always want to pay us less than what our work is worth so all the more we can sell ourselves and our partners short um well, actually, it needs to be a common effort, right? All of us need to stand our ground and need to, uh, you know, charge what it is that it costs to create that piece of work. That has been a discussion for many years, not only now in the virtual world. It's literally uh, content creation, social media. It's uh, me as a DMC. Everybody is working for months on a project before uh, realizing something or getting a confirmation. That is valuable time and money that is invested from each of us and that needs to be um, paid for and that's uh, a, a common um, well it, it's actually a big problem that we've reached based on people who have because of uh, competition uh, started doing things for free and then put everybody in the industry
industry in the same situation because then you create this mindset uh, with the clients that, okay, but that, that or that agency or that or that person did this for free or did that for us and didn't charge. Uh, and then someone else will say, okay, well, we'll do it this time. And then you kind of build a bigger, wider circle and it becomes the norm and it puts us all in a difficult position. Like nobody is working for free. We are yeah. all trying to make a living. So I yes, see, definitely. I think you have, I have, like, we have to be brave and start charging. It will be hard in the beginning. Yes, one event, two events. You might have like less attendees, but these attendees that you will have, you will have already much bigger ROI. Um, I also noticed that um, when you have free events and when you have pay events, um, you also get like more like admin work, like managing all these like people who sign up and don't, sh don't show up. And it it's, it's just pointless having them on your list when they don't show up or don't express any interest anyway. And I think as an industry, we just have this to have this collaborative effort and start charging for events. And that's a fact that costs that amount or that amount. And uh, yeah, it just everyone has to do it because if the bigger players keep doing it for free, then it will be always difficult for the smaller players to, to charge. But again, here we can come back to the community building <laughs> and um, having your expertise in your niche, et cetera. So yeah, uh, we have a comment from Lina. Clients don't always understand the scope of work we do. We need to be very clear and transparent how much time it takes. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Robert adds, pay to use it or lose it. Yeah, um, payment. That should be our 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 quote from now on for everybody. Like, yeah. <laughs> let's just put that on top of every proposal. <laughs> yeah, and Sabrina is saying pay, uh, payment also brings accountability and responsibility. Absolutely, that's absolutely yeah. When you pay for something, you are more likely to show up, and you you put more value to this. Um, moving to the, our next question, what interesting and innovative event formats from outside the events industry have you seen that can be applied to our industry? Well, um, to be honest, not so many. Um, <laughs> most of the other, other events I've seen are um, quite um, conference style like with, with very um, bland, uninteresting platforms with lots and lots of keynote speakers, one after the other, talking about their thing with very little engagement. So most of them have kind of been uh, disappointing. Um, I'm looking at things nationally and internationally, especially nationally. Um, not much has happened because I'm looking at what under what other industries are doing to have an understanding for for what is needed. Um, but it has been a bit disappointing. One of the events I liked attending was well, it's still a little bit our industry, but but uh, it's it's every industry in in one event. It's the Web Summit, um, but that is generally also because I um, knew them from before, obviously, like most people do. Uh, so you kind of know what they stand for. You know the brand. You trust them immediately, so it brings you on board e more easily. Um, I love the concept. So they had a couple of uh, of uh, engagement tools and ways of communicating that were uh, very nice, I believe. And also the look and feel of their event was exciting and interesting. Uh, they had lots of uh, live networking components as well. So yeah, I was happy. Uh, not everything was was great. Obviously, it it never is. But uh, but I was satisfied uh, when I attended that event, and I wanted to check out more. And I was you know eager to go into many sessions. They were like endless. You had like a huge uh, menu of things that you could attend, uh, and it was exciting enough to to keep me there and and to want me to uh, you know I wanted to learn. I wanted to go check out the speakers, etc because they have managed to to um, brand and promote themselves in a specific way that not many other companies have managed to do, I think. Yeah, so they had one specific feature which I think uh, I, want, I, want, I want to highlight. And this coming back to our industry where we have one-to-one -one meetings and WebSummit having the networking roulette. 
So um, mm -hmm. we always kind of try to, okay, so in, in the physical space, we have these one-on-one -on -one meetings at a trade show or um, a hosted by our event. But we can't get it into the virtual environment because it's like then it's us having a Zoom call and like you showed me like a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation. And it's like not so exciting because, you know, it's like, hey, like, you know, <laughs> well, okay. And, and then like, you know, and then you're just there. You have to be there for 10 minutes. And like, you're like waiting for the time to pass because you, you want to be unpolite. Uh, but then <laughs> the networking roulette, you have three minutes and you, you get a random um, partner to speak to. So you, you suddenly have like, hi, uh, I'm Marina. Well, I'm doing this and that. Who are you? What are you doing? Oh, cool. Interesting. Let's keep in touch. I edit on you. I add your contact details on the app. Uh, I'll connect you after this chat. And it's only three minutes. And, and you know, like there were some people like who were like from the health industry or like the, the, the cryptocurrency. And I say, sorry, like, but you know, we don't have anything in common. Nice to meet you. I wish you good <laughs> luck and good event. And, and it's done, you know, like this is the concept I think that we need really to apply more into the event industry. You put like buyers, you put suppliers, maybe you mix them up. Sometimes you can also match buyers and buyers or suppliers and suppliers. And just, you know, like have some fun, you know? It's like, don't mm. like protect yourself all the time. Oh, I don't want the buyers to know like the buyers or like, you know, the yeah. suppliers, they don't want to waste their time. No, like it, right now we can all learn from each other, I think. So uh, yeah, this like the winning concept I think that should be applied in our yeah. events. Um, yeah. I love networking, Carousel. It was uh, one of the first um, virtual events I attended in March had one as well, and it was still a little bit scary. But I did receive a lot of feedback from people because we were actually thinking to have one during the digital trip. And there was, uh, there are a lot of people who are still a little bit reluctant or perhaps uh, more shy, not very extrovert, and they find this quite scary. Yeah. Like they get anxious when they get like pushed to you know, thrown in front of people literally over and over again in a, a very va fast paced environment. It's definitely not for everybody. Not for everybody I no. do. I do uh, I love it very much. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Robert as well has some fine examples there. Yeah, he has the, yeah, that the roulette. The suppliers. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so the, like, the suppliers have a, a kind of a competition against each other. And I think like if anyone has... Um, viewed Robert's uh, presentation at IMAX, if it's still available. Planet IMAX, he talks Great about one. and it's very, very interesting. There are some very cool ideas. Yeah, so um, yeah, so this one is a very nice one. And uh, apart from that, I can't think like, because this concept was also repeated at Bits and Bretzels. It's another tech event. Um, yeah, the rest, nothing stayed in my mind. Well, what also was actually very nice is the, the, the Adobe Max conference which was mobile first like they have the app and you can watch all the sessions on your mobile which was amazing i think because it was a very intense conference you had a lot of like streams and uh, and then like you can still watch it on the go or like before bed or something on your phone so it's like really mobile first is also a very very nice um approach mm -hmm. to have um okay but anything so that's different right irina it comes back to that Anything that's creative, different, yeah. that is exciting, uh, that's what we want to see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, coming to our last question. If anyone has any questions, that's your time to ask. Uh, or, of course, you can get in touch with us anytime afterwards. Um, convention, uh, conversion happens through engagement. Uh, how do you create brand engagement online? And how do you find the balance between selling and providing educational content for personal or professional development? Because we just don't want to be sold all the time and we want mm. to be educated and inspired. Yeah, we touched on that. It's really um, the balance. It's really an individual thing. Uh, depending on who you are as a personal brand or who your company is, it will look different. Um, for me, it's it's really... A, 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 
sometimes I will post about what it is that we do. Sometimes I will post about the educational journey I'm going through myself. Like I talked a lot about what I did to upskill myself and the type of certification I took and things like that in the last couple of months. And sometimes it's just um, being there on a more personal level and, and talking to people about what you are going through in uh, during a specific day, you know, as asking for opinions, uh, connecting and asking for, for, for uh, different opinions coming from different groups of people. And that's been more important as well. But that's just me talking now. The only thing that we can agree on is that hard selling is definitely not working at the moment. <laughs> so yeah. this is really generally a fact for everybody. It's yeah. not about come here by this. People are either in situations where they are not able to buy or they are just not able to travel to get the services that you're offering. Uh, they don't want the hard selling part. They still want to be inspired. They still want to know what you have and what you're doing. And as uh, someone in the chat mentioned, um, I forgot who, the ones that are innovating, like show your innovation, show what you're doing differently. That is what attracts people and, and uh, keeps you visible. But that balance has to be there. Don't just talk about your products or yeah. services or whatever it is that you want people to buy from you. Yeah, so absolutely. I think thought leadership, content marketing, asking the community, for example, like in the end of every Instagram post, I always ask a question. Um, and I know that a lot of people, they, um, they just like go on my link and buy and read this blog post. It's like, again, you can't be creating more the friction. Like you have to take a next step to do something, but actually you also need like to stay in this one platform, like in this one photo on this one tweet and do this thing that <laughs> mm. um, <laughs> the person asked you to do. So um, yeah, this is, um, I think it's really important also to ask the community, like really it's asking questions, trying to engage. Um, and you know, I remember like from my, like a couple of years ago, I was at a conference and, and there was this one uh, big blogger, Instagrammer who said like, you know, like branded content can be exciting. It can be really good, you know, if you do it well. Um, branded content actually also, creates the conversation. And so if you want to do brand content, if you want to do sales, then really make sales exciting. Don't just do like, if you want more information, email us. No. Yeah, like, totally. To, no. You know, like use like videos and amazing photos, creative photos, like stop motion. Like there's so many creative things out there that you can do as a brand to um, bring kind of your brand to life as well. And it's okay to sell because we're all commercial people. We want business uh we don't we can't do everything for free all the time um so yeah it's um but ask, it's ask balance yeah ask, ask your audience what it is that they need and how you can help them you know what can you offer that is of value to them you can actually ask that question. You, know, you don't have to guess. You have, you have your network of people. So, so they can tell you what it is that will make them excited about what you are offering or how they will be more eager to work with you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and engage back as well. It's also very important. <laughs> uh, it's not just like me, 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 but it's a community that you have to build. Yeah, okay, so we are already chatting for one hour and I think uh, we are standing between the, our audience and their lunch. So <laughs> uh, so we will wrap up here. And uh, of course, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, Heidi, how can they do this? Well, at the Mice Guru, basically everywhere on all social media channels. <laughs> okay, excellent. So thank you every, everyone for joining us today. It was a very, very interesting discussion. Thank you for your questions. And the live uh, stream will stay, uh, so you can rewatch it or share with your friends, your colleagues. If you have any comments, suggestions, additions, let us know. Um, thank you, Sabrina, for your feedback. Wonderful life, ladies. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, everyone, for joining. It was, it's been a really pleasure. Uh, I know that Heidi was very busy the last month. I also wasn't live um, 
uh, on Instagram Live for a couple of months as well. So it's really nice to be back to the community and chat to you. So yeah, <laughs> uh, I wish you a very good rest of the week. And uh, just to support our fellow event professional, Sabrina, she has today also an Inst she has a LinkedIn Live today. LinkedIn Live. At 12.30, I believe, right? 12.30, is it? Um, Was it 12 or 12.30? Yeah, 12, 12, Sabrina, write in the comments. <laughs> and 30, um, on LinkedIn. Um, it's uh, in LinkedIn Live today uh, about social media. So uh, if you're interested in this topic in social media for business, so uh, join Sabrina, follow her on LinkedIn. Um, thank you, Lisa, for joining. Uh, thank you, Johnny, for joining. And Sabrina says it's 12.30. 12.30. So yeah, you can grab mm -hmm. lunch now very quickly and go back on LinkedIn to watch. <laughs> Sabrina and Jason talk about social media for events. So thank you everyone for today and I uh, hope we'll be, be, we'll be back soon with some uh, more exciting topics. Um, and um, we'll see Great. you soon. <laughs> thank, thank you, Irina. Thank you, thank everyone. You, Bye. <laughs>